concentrating in history and literature at the college. And I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag ERA Forum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Katie Packer Benson, Lena Esco, Jane Mansbridge, Johanna Masca, and tonight's moderator, Victoria Budson. Kezia, thank you so much, and thank you to those of you in the audience who are with us tonight. And I think the question is, why are we here talking about the Equal Rights Amendment? For some of you, you might think, this is deja vu. I've been in this conversation before. I can remember working for and fighting for this. For others of you, you may think, don't we already have equality? Why is this something that's important now? And we have a wonderful group of experts and panelists and leaders of movements to talk with us about it tonight. And first, to my, to my left, we have Johanna Masca, who, you, if you don't know her name, you know her work. She did messaging for the Obama administration and advanced all of the press efforts, not just for the eight years, but for the campaign for years before that, and is also CEO of the Global Situation Room. Katie Packer Beeson, who is a longtime Republican operative, deputy campaign manager for the Romney for President campaign, founding partner of Burning Glass Consulting. Jane Mansbridge, who those of us around the Kennedy School know as Jenny, and she is the Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Values and wrote Why We Lost the ERA, and is the recent past chair of the American Political Science Association. <laughs> Lena Esco, actor, producer, activist, star of SWAT, Kingdom, and producer and envisioner of Free the Nipple. And tonight, we're gonna have a conversation about the ERA, what it means now, what it has meant historically, what we need to do to get it passed, and what's next. And with that, I wanna turn it over to <laughs> Johanna to talk with us and really set the stage tonight. Why is this important? And What's taking place now? Yeah. Um, I'm grateful for uh, Harvard, for the Institute of Politics, um, to be all with all of you here tonight. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I grew up really after many people had been fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and I was really blessed. I grew up in Galesburg, Illinois. I started early on uh, the president's campaign in Iowa when people told me there was no way Barack Hussein Obama could be our next president. Um, and I got to see uh, this remarkable country in, in a way that uh, few people get to, um, this remarkable world. I traveled with President Obama to 40 countries. Um, you know, I think Me Too is indicative of a lot of things that many women have faced. And, I look back and I say, you know, we weren't even perfect. Um, we have a lot farther to go for women. We expect women to fit in a certain category or to do certain things, to be the caretaker. And um, so to me, talking about the Equal Rights Amendment couldn't come at a better time. People, you know, I joined uh, Lena and uh, Katie on this journey said, you will never get an equal rights amendment passed during the Trump administration with all Republicans. And I was like, oh, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think actually now is the time because people are seeing this assault on women in a way that they haven't seen it up close and personal. 
Um, and so to me, uh, Me Too is, um, is incredible because it's gotten people talking. Um, to me, we need to fix an institutional problem versus address it at an individual level. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard the name Phyllis Schlafly? <laughs> well, uh, Phyllis Schlafly was a woman who was uh, headed an organization called the Eagle Forum, very, very uh, engaged in opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment back in the 70s. Um, she was sort of this paragon of the family values community and was kind of somebody, as I was growing up in politics, was kind of just you know, in my peripheral vision, not really somebody that I paid a whole lot of attention to, but she certainly was somebody who had a voice and who, um, you know, spoke for a segment of the Republican Party, which I was very active and involved in. And about five years ago, um, I went to CPAC, the, what used to be the Conservative <laughs> Political Action Conference. I'm not sure that's how I would characterize it today. But anyway, um, a friend of mine who was a newly elected woman legislator from Michigan in her 20s had been invited to speak as one of these sort of rising stars in Republican politics. And so we went together, and while we were waiting for her time to come up, Phyllis Schlafly was speaking, and she was talking about you know, her history you know, in the conservative movement, and one of her big accomplishments was defeating the Equal Rights Amendment. And my friend Lisa and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, huh, you know, how do I even know what the Equal Rights Amendment says? You know, what, what is the Equal Rights Amendment? I've heard this and, mm. you know, it's kind of a liberal thing, but what does it even say? And we looked it up and we were kind of stunned <laughs> at the simplicity of it, which basically just said that ev any law that applies to a man also applies to a woman. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that and simpler or more basic than that, and we both kind of chuckled and looked at each other and said, I think I'm for that. <laughs> why, why, wouldn't, why would anybody not be for that? <laughs> um, and, and not long after that, Phyllis Schlafly passed away, um, just not too long ago, and uh, then Johanna reached out to me to talk about this issue, and I sort of shared her view that, you know, I think this is the time. Republicans right now are kind of looking for a way that they can do something <laughs> on behalf of women. And so maybe this is the time, which is sort of counterintuitive mm. to the environment we're in and the kind of president we have at the moment, that maybe this is the time to say, at least statutory, st statutorily, we should have something on the books mm. that says women have equal rights. And from there, we can sort of spell out what, all, what that means to women in the future. But we should just start there and get it on the books. And I actually do think that this is a prime opportunity and that we're probably not going to face as much opposition as we might have had Me Too not occurred at the time that it did. So I'm really excited about the, the perspective. And again, it's not something that was really on my radar, but as I've studied it and learned more about it, I think it is really critically important as sort of a base mark and, or a baseline um, and, and a place to build from. Jenny, can you talk with us a bit about the history of why we're still talking about the ERA <laughs> and why it didn't <laughs> pass the first time around? <laughs> well, yeah, the, my book was about, it's called Why We Lost the ERA, and it was about the strategy and the tactics. So those of you who are interested in the ERA, you can learn from this maybe, and those of you who are just interested in strategy and tactics in general. Um, one thing that's really important is that the ERA has to pass the states. And to pass in a state, you have to pass in the state districts. And one thing we did wrong was to organize a lot in DC and New York, um, and then kind of think that we could just uh, take that wholesale to Illinois, for example. And even uh, Phyllis Schlafly made that mistake. Um, one of the, when she and her troops moved into Maine, um, they took with them their entire tactics from Illinois and they ran a newspaper ad. I've got a quotation from the newspaper ad here. It reads, <coughs> um, what does the word sex mean in the ERA? Um, it says, um, the sex you engage in, homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual, sex with children, or whatever. One thing is for sure, militant homosexuals from all over America have made the ERA issue a top, hot priority. So the Republicans in Maine 
were very freaked out by this <laughs> ad because um, that's not, was, that was not their local culture. Um, and one of them, even the head of the anti-ERA organization, said that Schlafly felt she knew more than we did, but we had lived in this state. So I think the first lesson is, is if you're organizing in the states, which you have to do for constitutional amendment, let the people in the districts tell you what to do. Um, and then there are a couple other lessons. You want to hear some other lessons too? <laughs> we can go on. I, I would like to hear a couple other lessons. And as we're thinking about this time period, right, um, for those of us who've been engaged in women's movements, inclusive movements, specific movements, micro movements, um, movements that take place in university settings, movements that take place online, the election of Donald Trump did something pretty unique which is he took people from thinking about, talking about, and writing about, texting about, and turned that energy into people literally mobilizing in the streets. And not just in specific cities, right, like DC or New York, but writ large across the United States and across the globe so that we had the largest number of people coalescing physically in any movement in the history of time, having the women's marches. Now, something else. When people look back and say nothing has happened in Congress that's good for women in some time, one of our own students, Amanda Huen, unfortunately was the victim of sexual assault when she was here at Harvard, and through her experience as a survivor, created the Sexual Assault Survivor Bill of Rights. That would have been impressive. But she was able to have that legislation pass both federally and here at the state level. But federally, when it passed, it didn't squeak by, it passed unanimously, which is an extremely rare event on any topic, at any time. And I was hoping that, Jenny, you could kick us off, but that our panelists who know politics and the Hill could talk about what does it mean to have these unique set of circumstances, and if you could be a little prescient and talk with us about what might we see ahead and how do we capitalize on these unique times. Yeah, well, we were bipartisan back in the day. And in fact, the um, Republican Party first put the ERA on, uh, in its platform in 1940. They were the ones, they were the leaders. President Eisenhower was a huge supporter. President Nixon was a huge supporter. Pat Nixon was a huge supporter. President Ford was a huge supporter. Betty Ford, his wife, was a very, very active supporter. Then Ronald Reagan took it off the platform in 1980 possibly because of evangelical uh, uh, pressure. Um, but even though the president had taken it off the Republican platform, the women in Illinois, the Republican women in Illinois, the, particularly the politically active ones, were just as strong um, on the ERA. So it was always a, really a bipartisan endeavor. And I think that the Sexual Assault Survivors Act shows the fact that it could go through unanimously shows that maybe not necessarily, but just maybe in this highly partisan times, if you take something like that bill or the ERA, it might be that that could cut across the polarization that's driving all of us crazy mm -hmm. and be one mm -hmm. of the binders. It's, it's, it's not necessarily 100% in the bag, but I think we get a, a, an indication from that bill, the 2016 bill, that was very recent and it, we got, it got unanimity. So we could be, this could be a very, very interesting moment. And I'd like to bring Lena into the conversation to talk about what do you see with the Me Too and the Time's Up movements and the ability to bring in different tactics and ways of organizing, what do you see on the horizon? I believe there's nothing more important than women being protected under the federal law. I think Me Too movement, what they're doing is amazing. I feel what Time's Up is doing is amazing, but it's not sustainable, it's not, it's, it's temporary solutions, like what Joanna was saying. Uh, so, and this is the conversation that I have with other women. They're like, wait, the ERA, like, what is that? Or why is it important? There's all these chapters of women and men all over doing their own way of activism and, and, and their gender equality campaigns and their feminist campaigns and stuff like that. But there's nothing more important than this. And like majority of the countries around the globe have something in their constitution that states men and women are equal. We don't have that provision. And that's really embarrassing that America does not have that. Scalia said this before he died that, you know, women are not protected under the federal law. And if culture and society has changed, well, 
then it needs to change in the Constitution, and until then, he has to abide with what the Constitution says. So it's all written there, and I feel, for example, with Free the Nipple, everybody <laughs> turned their back on me. This was in 2010, I said I wanted to direct a feature film about starting a conversation about uh, gender equality and feminism in a time where there was no new wave of feminism. And everyone laughed at me, my agents dropped me, everybody laughed. And so I decided to continue doing it, and I ended up raising the money, ended up selling the film, and ended up being one of the leading movements before the Time's Up and before the Women's March and before uh, the Me Too movement. Uh, obviously, it was more disruptive, but at the time, we needed to do it. Um, it was never about going topless. It was about the nipple. The nipple was the <laughs> Trojan horse that was actually going to start the conversation, and nobody would have paid attention to what I was doing if I was started a movie called Equality and nobody was going topless, or a movement called Equality. So it was something I had to do at the time, and uh, it goes along with how I've always been a rebel. I guess that's why we all kind of, we're all so different. Uh, but I feel that we have the right condiments here to get this going. There's all these organizations trying to pass the ERA. It obviously hasn't worked. For the last 40 years, they've been introducing the bill into Congress and it has not passed. There's somebody in there not letting it move forward. And with the plan that we have, it's very strategic, hiring the right people and doing the right thing and, and raising the right money to do what we're doing. My friend uh, Steve Bing was one of the three people to legalize a gay marriage. Uh, believe it or not, that came out of nowhere. Remember, it was just like, what? The Supreme Court just passed and legalized gay marriage? Like, I didn't even know there was a fight happening, like a, a legit one. And my friend was one of them. And they did it very strategically behind uh, closed doors. And um, the marches are amazing, but are they really doing anything? Like, they are. They're letting us know that people are hungry to change and hungry to stand up and do something about what's currently happening in our society. And that's why I feel what we're gonna be doing is gonna be more strategic, no, no more petitions. Petitions are not really taking us anywhere in terms of what we're trying to do. You know, I think this it also raises another point, which we keep addressing women's equality and you only have women on stage, but what Lena and I talked about from the beginning was the importance of building a new coalition you, I love this new, the new coalition with new tactics um, and a new outcome. And that inc is it inclusion, uh, inclusive of Republicans, of men, of people of color, of every different religious background, Americans. And I do firmly believe that equality is as important to men as it is to women. Um, being a millennial mom and working with my husband to balance our child care and our child rearing, we have both that feeling of not wanting to leave our child and go to work. But you both make these different sacrifices. And in balancing it, um, one of the journalists who saw me traveling all the time when my son was young said, you don't even know yet, but your husband's going to have a great relationship with your son because he's taking care of him all the time. And she's right. And because we've been able to balance this and have equality in our relationship, we're stronger for it. And I believe America is stronger for all of our equality. One of the things that I think is the beauty of this, um, going back to Jenny's point, is that it shouldn't be controversial. <laughs> this should be sort of a no-brainer. And one of the things that I think was difficult um, with the Women's March that I, I don't think Democrats and liberals really saw, they just sort of looked at this and said, well, of course, every woman should march, every woman should be a part of this. But if, like me, you're a pro-life woman, you were sort of told you weren't really welcome at the Women's March. That if you're not signing on to this pro-choice platform, that they didn't really want you marching on all the other issues. And I kind of looked at it and I was very conflicted because I thought, you know, well, I'm all in on all mm. these other issues, mm. but that's just an issue that for me, I hold very sacred. The ERA is not like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you stand on any of these other policy issues you can be for the Equal Rights Amendment. And there's no reason for anybody to be opposing it. We don't really know who these people are that have sort of put roadblocks up along the way, other than you know, the issue that I have heard come up time and time again that Phyllis Schlafly really 
sort of drilled into people's heads was this issue of the draft. Mm -hmm. And that all of a sudden our girls are gonna be drafted if we have an equal rights amendment. And my first thought was, well then obviously we don't have equal rights if they're not being drafted today. Yep. So um, it, it sort of enforces the point that we don't really have equal rights in this country because we have a, a law on the books that only applies to young men. And my husband, who's pretty open-minded, his first reaction was, well, yeah, I mean, I don't think I want my 16-year-old daughter to get drafted. And my sister, you know, other Republicans that I talked to, that's kind of the knee-jerk reaction. But interestingly, it's changed culturally for the girls that would affect. Every young girl that I talked to, that I asked this question of, has said, I'm okay being drafted. Yeah, I'm, draft me. I mean, if I'm gonna ask for all the rights, I should have the responsibilities. And several of them have pointed to um, uh, Wonder Woman and said, you know, she was in the Israeli military and she's kind of a badass, so you know, I wouldn't mind doing that. You know, and it's just interesting how culture is kind of ahead of where we are statutorily. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of ready to go and they don't mind this concept. Um, but it's these kind of antiquated notions that we have of whose job it is to protect and you know, whose job it is to nurture um, that are holding us back. What, this, what Katie was saying real quick about the exclusion of the Women's March, it, it is a big problem in a lot of these movements and feminist movements in the back, in the past, excluding men excluding people, pointing fingers, when at the end of the day, we are also part of the problem. And this is why movements, female movements, feminist movements have never moved fast forward enough is because women tend to be competitive, women tend to be jealous, women get, tend to be catty and they get caught up in that. And that's something we need to completely push out and, and Free the Nipple was always about men and women coming together for gender equality. And what we're doing here with the human campaign, it's the same thing, inclusion of everyone. Yeah, and I just met these folks this morning, and I can tell you the synergy that I felt <laughs> and feel at this moment is very strong. I think that this is catching a wave. I think this is the right moment. Mm -hmm. I think people are so tired of the polarization and longing for uh, mm -hmm. something that can mm -hmm. cut right across mm -hmm. it, and I don't see why the ERA couldn't be that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got a little footnote on the draft thing, which is that mm -hmm. uh, the women who promoted the ERA last time didn't pick this up because they didn't want to pick it up, but it is the case that um, there's something called the doctrine of military necessity in constitutional interpretation. And um, it means that, for example, our military forces don't have the same First Amendment rights that um, just plain civilians do because the Supreme Court has got something they call deference to the military. Doesn't mean that military can do anything they want, but within a certain... So if the military were to decide that it wasn't militarily good to draft women, the Supreme Court would not intervene because of this long, long history of Supreme Court interpretation. So that's, a, that's just a kind of footnote on the draft thing. This, the, the military could say, it's not right for us, and I then the Supreme Court would go along. I do think it's interesting. I know, you know, when I talk to people, I think we're having a whole conversation about service to our country and, you know, whether we should consider, you know, the importance of service, whether it's Teach for America, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, and military service, and whether, you know, that could be a way, again, to unite people, to bring the country together. Mm -hmm. and and allow us all to have that conversation of what is, you know, so fundamental um, to America, which is, you know, our, our uh, values, our, our country. And, and so you're right to the point of, you know, when someone says, oh, you know, my son's gonna be drafted, but a daughter would not, um, is that right? Um, I think a, a woman has as much to offer in service um, as a man, and uh, I may, you know, have a son who would rather do Teach for America, where I have a daughter who wants to be on the front lines of the military, and, and I think that's okay. And one of the things that we've seen as we look at the history of how men and, will, men and women and gender has played out in the military in the United States and military service, is we now have uh, our recent past secretary, 
of Defense in the United States, Ash Carter, finally finished the job of opening all roles within the military and military combat to women. And so service, in addition to obviously uh, women should have the right to fully serve their country in whatever way that they would choose, but we also see the military acknowledging the importance of fully utilizing all of our talent, and not just 49%. And when we think about the United States, in 1776, the nation, of course, was formed. In 1789, the political structure as we see it today with the bicameral legislature and so forth was created, and we look at women and our roles in leadership, we are nowhere near equal, right? If we want to look in the public sector, women hold roughly 20% of the seats in Congress, both in the House and the Senate. When we look at women as CEOs, we're still in single-digit numbers looking at Fortune 500s. When we look at where we're comfortable having women, in legislative bodies, about 20%, and any type of executive leadership that's single digits, we have a long way to go, but it's not just cultural, it is within the law. Mm -hmm. And the ERA is a way of s stating really not an aspirational goal, but a floor, that women have to have the same equality that men do. And as we're talking about this today, can you share with us, in addition um, to the desire to have inclusive movements, what do you see as the strategy? Is the idea to go state by state and look for the additional three states to ratify? Um, is there a different vision on how it might take place? Is it a multi-pronged vision? Yeah, our goal is by 2020, the 100 year anniversary of a woman's right to vote in the Constitution, which I fully admit does not in, in allow full uh, voter uh, inclusion, but uh, by 2020, the 100 year anniversary of the women's right to vote, we want to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, we have been uh, trying to find, again, the right lawyers who are going to be able to help us um, because there's a lot of questions of, you know, what you have to do at the federal level. The federal level, they, they already did this and passed it at a federal level, but there was a timeline. Do you have to extend the timeline or do you have to repass the, the Equal Rights Amendment at the federal level? 36 states have now already passed it. So 35 states before the deadline. Nevada just recently passed it. Um, it's already pending before many state legislatures. Virginia recently, uh, there were folks who went into the legislature and, uh, and tried to get this passed and they said, well, it's not at the pe federal level. So you have to take it back to the federal level. Um, but there wasn't, um, you know, mass, there, there isn't, you know, a lot of, uh, sentiment against it in Virginia based on the uh, telling of the news articles. It was just, this isn't the process procedurally. Um, so uh, we are, as part of it, um, looking at the options. My ideal is to get it through the federal level, and then my hope is that we can use a lot of the ratifications that are standing to get this passed quickly by 2020. So Jenny? I'll just add a little bit <coughs> here, because it's an amazing story. Um, after the ERA uh, came to the end of its deadline in 82, everybody just said, sort of, well, that's, that's that, and it became history. Um, why is it back now? And the story is amazing. There was an stu undergraduate student at the University of Texas who was writing a paper in a course on the ERA, and he was sort of digging around and whatnot, and he found this m amendment that had been proposed by James Madison, back in, whatever it was, 1789. And um, it had gone up to the states and it had gotten about five or six states ratified. And then for one reason or another, it's sort of like they stopped. It was, a, it was just, it was an amendment that said if you passed a pay raise in Congress, you had to have a roll call vote. Oh, right. It was a pretty mm -hmm. procedural thing. Mm -hmm. And he got the bit in his teeth and he said, I'm gonna try to pass this, this amendment. And darned if he didn't spend the next five years of his life going around from state to state, getting all these states to join in on what was called the Madison Amendment. He, it passed. He got, 20, he got all, 38 states. It became the 27th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And they, you know, it was totally uncontroversial. Un so it got to, to the Washington and the registrar just you know, checked it off and it was printed in the Federal Register and da-da-da-da, the Congress voted on it almost unanimously. And that was the end of that. 
And then um, some women at, in a Virginia law school, a relatively small law school, decided, well, wait a minute. If you could do that to, an amend to this amendment that James Madison had started out, what about the ERA? Yeah, it said that there was a, a, a time limit on it, but that was just a majority vote in Congress. That's not actually part of the amendment itself. So that could just, the majority in Congress could decide not to have that time limit. It doesn't take any fancy constitutional stuff. And then all we'd need is three more states. You can't rescind. None of the states who are already signed up can rescind. So actually, in that legal theory, all you need is three more states. And if you got three more states, so this crazy Madison Amendment was the thing that opened the door to the mm -hmm. ERA to walk right through. It's a really fun, fun story to me because, you know, here I am teaching courses and stuff like that. The idea that someone could do a paper in one of my courses and have it turn into the 27th Amendment of the United <laughs> States, <laughs> you know, is really great. And then to have that turn into a possible ERA, that's a big door to walk through. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly is. As we're thinking about the next steps, Lena, could you share a bit for those who are here today and for those who are listening, if people want to get involved, how should they do that? We have a website, uh, thehumancampaign.org. Uh, we are in the process of raising money. Uh, it's a 24-month campaign, as Joanna said, and we're hoping this will happen by 2020 when it's 100 years since women first won the right to vote. Uh, Right now, this is not about us, it's about everybody else. Everyone is involved, like this is not our thing, this is everyone's thing. And uh, the website would be the first step, I think, right now. I mm -hmm. think we're in the beginning process of, of getting to where we need to get, and the money that we're raising is gonna be to hire lobbyists, First Amendment lawyers, Republican and Democrat people who work for us, basically, yeah. for the next 24 months. There's been hundreds of cases uh, since the ERA died in 1982 where women have gone into all the way up to the Supreme Court and the case has never moved forward and they've lost it because it, al it always goes back to the 14th Amendment and the 14th Amendment is not in our favor. Yeah. <laughs> so we keep losing over and over and over and over and over and over. So hopefully the ERA will be the 28th Amendment by 2020. Amendment. One other thing that I would just add to that is um, just talking about it. Mm -hmm. is yeah. a really important thing. One of the things that we've all been talking about is that as we've talked to others about it, there's sort of a general sense of apathy mm -hmm. about this issue. A lot of even women say, well, I mean, I feel like I have equal rights. I don't, I mean, do we really need a constitutional amendment to have this? And so just raising awareness and when you see articles, you know, kind of sharing them with your friend group and your family and just sort of ginning up the discussion I think is really important to what we're trying to do. You know the campaign um, with the Obama campaign early Iowa uh, our motto was respect empower include um, and a lot of the volunteers would come and you know give our teams really good ideas and um, we would empower them to help and and do that idea. And that's, I think, uh, again, you know, it's, it is, it's the website um, to connect and we're all open to connection and those ideas of how we can further the discussion. But as I said to Lena and Katie, we were talking early, if, um, if at the end of this campaign, you know, it was anything about those of us on stage, we failed. It's like the Obama campaign. Um, you know, if you would put David Plouffe, David Axelrod, and uh, President Obama on stage, it would not have been representative of what we built, which was energy from every generation, energy from every different uh, background, um, coming together and bringing about change. And that's the goal of this. And as we're having this discussion, I'm going to have our panelists talk just a bit more, but this is the moment that if you have a question, please join us at the microphones, we have four. There's two down here. There's two on the loges. Um, feel free to go up to any of them to ask a question. Um, our practice in the forum is that whatever discussion we're having, you can ask any question that is about the topic that ends in a question mark and a single question, please. Mm -hmm. So while people are coming <laughs> uh, to the mic, a lot of rules. Yeah. <laughs> so we've heard a bit about the the human campaign and sort of of the people. 
We've heard a bit of some of the values within the Obama campaign and how that can be applied. Talk to us from the Republican lens. This was a Republican issue. This came out of the Republican Party. How do you see weaving this back into what has been so closely identified with the party that then really got separated off as kind of mm -hmm. women's issues rolling away from what had um, been firmly begun there? Yeah, I think that the early ERA that, that Jenny talked about was not so kind of wrapped up in um, reproductive rights, in sort of the sexual revolution, you know, the Gloria Steinem era that was all sort of kind of uh, circulating in the country um, back in the 70s. And what happened is during that time, it kind of got rolled into that silo. Right. And that became a threat, not only to many men, but it also became a threat to sort of the traditional values community. Mm -hmm. And so they viewed this as part and parcel of the sexual revolution and that they needed to stop the Equal Rights Amendment because it was going to mean, you know, gay people flagrantly, you know, presenting themselves in society. <laughs> it was going to mean, um, you know, transgender bathrooms and, you know, all of these things that um, were kind of stirred up to scare people and make them fearful. Um, and, and I think the important thing today is to separate it from the controversy and make this just about basic rights and basic protections in the Constitution. And I do think that there are many, many Republicans who um, are very open-minded on a lot of these issues that were very controversial back in the 70s um, and, and not so scared of this kind of element of the Republican Party and the conservative movement as they were before. And, and, you'll, and that's why I think you see in a state like Virginia mm -hmm. where the Republican um, establishment in Virginia is very, very conservative, mm -hmm. but they're open to this. And there's not the same kind of fear um, that was generated back in the 70s. I think there's a great opportunity. And, and I, I haven't talked to any Republican elected officials that have concerns about this. They're very... Um, open and kind of ready to go on it. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, first question, and please introduce yourself as well. Hi, I'm Kezia. I'm a sophomore at the college, and my question, is also thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question is, how does the 14th Amendment not mm. function in the way that this amendment would? Yeah. And there's why is it so important that <laughs> we pass this? Sorry. No, thank you. There's a great Radiolab podcast about how Ruth Bader Ginsburg finally got gender inclusion um, into the 14th Amendment, but it's at a different threshold. Um, so you have to meet a higher threshold for gender equality um, to have a case. Um, and uh, if you listen to the podcast, it's really interesting because I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg is this brilliant uh, chess player. She found uh, men who were uh, not able to buy beer until 21 years old in Oklahoma. Um, and uh, women could buy beer at 18. And uh, she took that case um, to the Supreme Court to finally get uh, gender inclusion interpreted in the 14th Amendment, under the 14th Amendment. Again, it's not at the same threshold. Um, I don't think that's acceptable. I think. Uh, in fact, uh, I had a brilliant woman, Dr. Ava, said, language is power. And our language needs to reflect the values. And little boys and little girls need to know that they're equal. And until they do, that's not fair. So that's why I think we can't uh, count on the 14th Amendment and an interpretation of the 14th Amendment that took um, men who couldn't buy alcohol to get um, as full gender in inclusion in the U.S. Constitution. The other thing that I would add to that is um, two people that have e are either currently on the Supreme Court or recently on the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia, have both spoken out on this issue in recent years and said very clearly that women don't have the protections that men have. And I'm no constitutional scholar, 
but Antonin Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg sure are. <laughs> and if both of them can agree that this is an area where women are not protected under the Constitution, that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. And there's a me little too. interesting piece in constitutional, or tragic piece in constitutional history here, because the Supreme Court was using the 14th Amendment to set to decide cases that came closer and closer to women's equality. And then came a very important case. Um, and they said, well, the ERA was before the states at the time. And they said, well, um, we should let the American people settle this. We shouldn't take the final step to interpret the 14th Amendment to be like an ERA, because if the American people wanted that, they would go for an ERA. So the actual fact that the Equal Rights Amendment was in front of the states being ratified at the time meant that the court stopped interpreting the, it could possibly have t interpreted the, e the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. to give equal rights to m women. But it stopped short because, ironically, the Equal Rights Amendment was out there in, among the, in the states. So the court stopped short and that's where we are, we're, we're short. Concisely put. Yes. Hi, my name is Ryan Davis, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, I thought Katie brought up uh, an important point about how um, the ERA is a necessary next step, but we build from there. Um, and I think it's important to realize that it doesn't wave a magic wand and fix right. gender inequality immediately. And I don't think it would be completely illogical to argue that maybe the ERA would stifle future women's rights movements because those who currently say that there isn't an issue have more reason to argue that after it's passed. And so my question is, after we pass the ERA, what is the next step? How do we follow up so that we have full gender equality? Um, if I may, one of the things that happens whenever one passes a law, and of course at the Kennedy School of Government, we focus on how does government really function, is once you have the passage, you then both need a mechanism for people to have awareness. So the next stage of the campaign is for people to be aware of what is the ERA, what just passed, how will it impact me or should it. Then the next step is, is there enforcement? And how will those mechanisms be built over time? How will this impact the way the states are um, interpreting their choices within state by state law? We don't have any place in the United States where women have full equivalent rights under the law that then manifest as such. So there'll be a set of case law which develops over time defining what this looks like, and then the hard work of having the other laws which take place become synchronized with the expectation and the outcomes of equal rights. Um, so those are just a few thoughts, and I didn't know if any of our mm -hmm. other panelists would like to jump in. Do, but I know Jenny. It's a lifestyle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being in favor of both and seeing everyone as equal. I think that's just a lifestyle. It's just you have to adapt it. It has to be so normalized in our in our society at all times that it just it's not it's it's not even a conversation. The, re the <laughs> if we're having a conversation and we're still having it ten years from now when the ERA has passed, then it didn't really do much. Mm -hmm. So hopefully there won't be a conversation in yeah. five years, three years, four. Yeah. Maybe the history of it, yes. Well, it's easy to sit um, in Boston, Massachusetts, or in Washington, D.C., or in New York City, and just assume that everybody presumes that we're all equal. Because that's where you know, your sort of friend group is and your social settings kind of reinforce that. But I was telling these ladies the other day about an experience I had um, after the 2012 campaign the uh, Dole Institute um, at the University of Kansas hosted an event for kind of the operatives from the Obama campaign and from the Romney campaign. And I was there representing the Romney campaign along with um, a guy who's now my husband. Um, <laughs> but at the time we had been the two deputy campaign managers for the Romney campaign. And it was a two day thing and it was so interesting the first day, all these young girls came up to me and said, you know, it's so great to see a conservative woman at a high level in politics, you know, to know that, you know, maybe that's something I could do someday. And I felt, you know, well, like, wow, like I'm really inspiring these young <laughs> ladies. <laughs> you know, felt so proud. And then um, the second day, a gentleman walked up to me and he was probably in his mid-60s. 
and seemed like a nice enough guy, and he said, you know, you made some really good, powerful points. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, but you should let him talk more because I think he could make them more powerfully. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I kind of looked around to see if I was being punked <laughs> because I thought, who would, who would even think that, let alone actually say it to me? I mean, I felt like I wanted to slap him and, you know, Rich, you know, kind of made a joke like, oh, well, you know, I'm just the arm candy. She's the brains around here, you know. To, but I almost felt embarrassed that he felt like he had to kind of come to my aid. But that's the environment that we live in, that there are people that think that way. And, uh, you know, people of color experience this all the time. Women experience it an awful lot. That there are people that just think that they're better and the one thing that the Constitution would do is say, most of America doesn't agree with you. You're the outlier here. Most of America believes that we are equal. Mm -hmm. And it puts pressure and it puts shame. <laughs> and so I do think that that's kind of the next step is using that as a weapon to shame people that would say, I'm better because I'm a man or I'm, a better, be I'm better because I'm white, whatever it is this sort of thing is a tool to shame people into reevaluating their outlook. Yeah. Congressman, woman, uh, Pat Schroeder, uh, was one who one of my advisors uh, hooked me up with, and she's amazing. Um, you know, she, there's this great ma makers video of her when she first got to Congress and they're trying to swear in her husband. And, and she's like, no, 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 me. And he's like, I'm just here to get her on the committee she wants. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in it, she said something that really uh, hit home with me having had a child in the White House and um, my husband's uh, paternity leave from the Associated Press was like one week, but women were on disability leave um, for eight weeks. Now, I was in Afghanistan at seven weeks because I was organizing the live address to the nation one year after the death of Osama bin Laden and was crucial to that. I would have loved had we had equal uh, leave and because we were both bringing a child into this world, it would have been more equitable. And so, you know, what she said was, it's almost like, you know, for a while they've been like, you go girl, you know, y you go do it all, but, you know, that's the end of it. And I think what but we... We're not going to help you. Yeah, we're not going <laughs> to help you. But I think, you know, now it's even an economic issue, which if we reframe it in that way, um, you know, even if you just look at the future of um, the Fed predictions, we need women fully engaged in this economy. Um, and I think, you know, it's important for men and women to have that opportunity. So I think the time is right. And I know when I read uh, Jenny's book, one of the things I thought was so interesting is she said, you know, maybe in 10 or 20 years, the environment will be right to revisit this. And her book was written in 1986. <laughs> so I think we're overdue. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is, <clears throat> is Damien. I'm a sophomore at the college. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the movement with us today. Uh, my question is about gender. Um, you all spoke about how inclusive uh, the movement is, and it sounds like a beautiful thing. Um, when you introduce gender and the, the 21st century conversation around gender, and it, it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, you're unified across ideology right now, but if you were to reword the amendment and say all genders are equal, that's when you lo lose conservatives. And if you're to pass an equal rights amendment that says men and women are equal, where does that leave gender nonconforming people? So um, what, what is your relationship like surrounding this issue? Um, and then when issues say if this amendment is to be passed, if it's to be interpreted um, along the lines of the bathroom issue, what happens mm -hmm. to your relationship there? So if you can address some of the um, issues around inclusivity around gender. That, that, that was an issue that came up before. Um, and if you read the language, it's uh, the language it took a long time to get to. It's equality under the law shall not be denied or abridged based on sex. Um, that's the language. So it was, you know, it's... Um, it doesn't mention men or women. Yeah. Or, or the word gender. Or yeah. the word gender. 
Um, and uh, the language is actually really important um, in terms of quick passage to preserve the language that was well debated at the time. Um, and uh, the question about transgender bathrooms has come up um, before, and in fact they were talking about the right to privacy um, would uh, protect um, uh, bathrooms. Now, this is, I think, the debate that, you know, uh, we likely agree on is that, you know, um, people have, have moved forward. There's been a lot of progress, right? Um, and, uh, and you say, you know, let's, um, you know, have the whole inclusive, should we change the language, should we not? I would say, number one, we can't change the language because the, the quick uh, language is important to the passage. And number two, it protects people. And number three, this can't be a culture war, and it shouldn't be a culture war. It's pretty basic. Quality under the law shall not be denied or abridged based on sex. And I think that we can all agree there. And, um, you know, progress is slow, right? That arc of justice. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, the next steps on equality are yet to be seen. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to. Much yeah. it. Well said. <laughs> well said. I mean, yes. So great to see all these guys here at this I know, discussion. I love this. <laughs> so my name is Nikhil Patel. I'm a uh, student at the business school. And my question relates to businesses. Um, recently, you've seen organizations like the NBA, Delta, mm -hmm. other groups playing a role in potentially shifting policy or where businesses make investments based on the politics of that state. What kind of role do you think businesses can play here, and how do you activate those leaders? Mm -hmm. um, one example I could probably provide is Mary Barr of GM. She is a powerful woman in business in a place where you'll probably have to make investments across the country, um, and it leads to jobs. Does she have the power to actually influence the state to potentially ratify and without that not move forward? Mm -hmm. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that this is, again, an issue that there should be nearly universal support for. I mean, any sort of educated thinking individual should look at this and say, this makes sense, and there's no reason to oppose it. Mary Barr is a great example. Um, I don't know if you remember when she first was given the job, or, or earned the job, I should say, as CEO, she was asked the question very famously on a um, morning talk show, you know, how are you gonna balance being a mother with having a high profile job like this? A question that I don't recall a man ever <laughs> encountering. <laughs> um, so, thank you. <laughs> what a great person for us right. to potentially reach out to um, that, that could be a strong voice on this issue. But again, the, the challenge that, um, that we have found ourselves encountering is um, you know, sort of a sense of urgency about this, that there are people like that that would agree with this, but they sort of go, you know, but do, do we really need to spend money on this? Is this a pressing thing? There seem to be a lot more important issues that we're facing right now. So the, the challenge that we have is sort of getting it into the water table, getting people talking about it and creating a sense of urgency about it. Um, and I think if we can get to that, then I think all kinds of people like that should be fertile ground for us. From a strategic point of view, I think this is where Republican women could be very helpful because there are, a lar as you know, a large number of Republican women who would be very happy mm -hmm. to get on board. And those are the kinds of people who could go to the CEOs that you're talking about. They're the best people to go to those CEOs um, as a small group and say, look, we want, we Republican women want you to get on board. Mm -hmm. Even if the CEO is a Democrat, that will be very impressive to a businesswoman. A bipartisan, nonpartisan campaign is definitely more in the mm -hmm. interest. And I think you're seeing, you know, I know WeWork said by 2020 they're going to have 50% representation. You're seeing a number of uh, organizations step up and say they want gender parity, they want inclusion. Um, those things are really important, and so we certainly want their support. Um, we'll take any of their support, um, but you know, to the extent that we see uh, companies and we see athletes and we see people, you know, stepping up, I think it's because there's a void in leadership in, um, you know, uh, 
not having the leadership that we want right now at a uh, federal level in some cases. And so I guess we're the weed leaders that we're waiting for, right? We just need to <laughs> do it. <laughs> and we've seen some really strong examples, for example, here in Massachusetts, where the business community coalesced around things like the recent pay equity bill and really led and gave an example where no CEO wanted to be left off that stage and doing something good for women. And I think that's the kind of climate that we can bring forward because, again, when one looks at the language mm -hmm. which Joanna so eloquently summarized, it really is something that is non-threatening, is sensical, and because businesses are already responsible, providing equality within their organizations because of Title VII and, uh, and other provisions, they're already doing the legwork. And this, in some ways, would require um, organizations and entities outside the business community to catch up. Um, hi, my name is Jackson and I'm a sophomore at the college. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, I just had a quick question for Lena, um, being that um, I think we've seen recently the power of film and visual media um, to promote these messages of equality, such as you know Black Panther or Wonder Woman. And I just was wondering what your take was on um, the power of media to promote this message of equality that is so necessary. Absolutely. I mean, I'm at CAA, and uh, we had a meeting. I brought Joanna over to my agency. We had a meeting about it. It's really important. I grew up in Hollywood. I grew up doing this. And uh, even in my job now, playing the only female SWAT officer, I had to go in the writer's room and talk about the importance that I wanted to do majority of my stunts. I wanted to be exposed to doing fight sequences the way you would write them to men because I want to be able to do that. I want to show that and I think about the impact and the women and the men that are watching the show. So it all changes. Um, Helen Mirren uh, about, I don't know, a few years ago, she read a script and they offered her a role in the script and she says, I want to play that role, which was uh, written for a man. And the director and the producers were like, well, it's going to be a process. We need to start shooting soon. Like, and she's like, no, 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 just change the name. And that's where it comes down to it. There's, there's, there's mm -hmm. obviously a, a shift happening with Atomic Blonde and Wonder Woman and Wakanda. Uh, uh, sorry, Black Panther. Sorry, I just watched the movie yesterday, uh, two days ago. And uh, even Frozen or Brave. Brave was the first Disney Pixar film directed by Brenda Chapman. It was a story about her and her daughter. And... Disney at the time and Pixar, which was, I don't know, seven years ago, they fought her. They wanted a love story within the, the film, and she kept fighting it. No, this is a journey about a young girl becoming a warrior, and that was a fight up until the end. Until this day, it was one of the first movies before Frozen where the whole story is about the, the journey of a warrior, of a, of, a, of a woman becoming herself and not needing a love story to complete her. Uh, and it all comes from the brainwashing that we've had in the, all these Disney movies growing up. You know, us women, us young girls believing in this fantasy, which can be there, but we grow up kind of handicapped, feeling mm -hmm. like we're not complete unless we have that Prince Charming by the time we're 28, 29, or 30 and settling. Not that it's never going to happen. It's going to happen. It happens when you're okay with being complete and not waiting for this, this fairy tale. So I think there is m a major shift, and also the Me Too movement and the Time's Up has taken it to another level. Um, with women speaking up about what happens with the casting couch in Hollywood. I've experienced it many times. Uh, I'm open to this, but I, I got raped twice before I was 18. And uh, being in front of Harvey Weinstein uh, in 2011 uh, led me to be able to walk away from it uh, with, with the way he was talking to me and the offers that he was doing to me at the time. I was able to walk away from it by what had happened to me before and handle somebody as intense and somebody as uh, intimidating as him. Um, and now because it's so normalized to talk about this and it feels so safe to talk about this, I'm here talking about this. And uh, I think it was, it's very loud and clear that Hollywood is changing as every day it's changing, but now more than ever, I believe that there's gonna be more stories of women um, taken in really strong roles and who goes to the movies who are a majority of the people going to the movies and paying for them women uh so uh there is a shift and again boys and little girls watching movies like this is sending a strong message of the the change that's happening and all the bias i mean i'm seeing it yeah. even with my young son um my husband at one point was like 
he's, you know, got all these girlfriends who he's fond of, and he's like, oh, you know, they're all going to be fighting over you. I'm like, do not continue the narrative of women fighting over men. That is completely disgusting. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. Like, you watch these movies like Wonder Woman. Like, that first opening sequence of Wonder Woman had me crying. It wasn't like the rest of the movie. That sequence of all these women warriors fighting yeah. each other and and training each, each other. other. I was like, oh my God, because you've seen men mm -hmm. kick ass forever. All <laughs> these action movies, it's always men. It's like boring, cliche. Now you see women like Atomic Blonde, Charlize Theron in that movie, or Gal Gadot and, and Wonder Woman. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm sure it sent a really strong message to executives in Hollywood being like, okay, let's start putting women in these places. I mean, look at Black Panther. You had all these women running the whole army. Mm -hmm. around uh, Black Panther. Well, and if you haven't watched SWAT, <laughs> she's a total badass. <laughs> so let's not forget about that. <laughs> it is true. It is, it is actually to our benefit that we have a total badass to partner with. And here we're the ones cursing. Lena was like, is it cool if I curse at Harvard? <laughs> <laughs> I curse all the time. I feel like I'm, not, I'm super passionate, and there's only one word that can take me to the passionate a hundredth degree which is the word fuck in any sort of way so i need it sometimes because i can say i love you but if i say i fucking love you it really <laughs> matches up to my passion so uh, well, thank you so much thank yeah. you and our last question for the evening um hi my name is brinkley um i'm a freshman at the college thank you for being here today um i was listening to a podcast the other day on gender equality and one of the interviewees was a Republican woman, and um, the interviewer asked her, are you a feminist? And she said, yes, but mm. I don't support X, I don't support Y, and I don't support Z, and um, uh, pro-choice was one of those. And so you spoke a bit about this earlier, but how do you isolate your message from other social rights topics without diminishing their message as well? Mm. Well, I, this is an issue that I've struggled with because growing up, again, um, you know, I grew up in an evangelical Christian home. I grew up, um, you know, in a home full of Republicans. <laughs> um, I started out early as a Republican political operative. And the word feminist meant something negative to me. It meant, you know, bra-burning, you know, Gloria Steinem, sexual revolution, you know, no responsibility. Um, it, it just, it, you know, I, and maybe it was... You know, the TV shows that w were on in my home, I, I, I can't really say what I would attribute it to, but I thought of feminism as sort of a very liberal Democrat thing, and that didn't really fit me very well as a Republican. Um, I now call myself a feminist. I'm not sure a lot of traditional feminists would call me a feminist because I'm pro-life. And it's, it's been made very clear to me that, you know, well, you can't really be a feminist if you, you know, aren't, aren't pro-choice. Um, I've, I've had an argument with my cousin that's lasted now about 20 years over this issue. Um, but I believe very strongly in equal rights for women in terms of um, economics, in terms of job security, in terms of access to capital, in terms of... Um, you know, violence against women, <laughs> you know, pretty much every other issue is something that I would probably share the views of every Democrat woman uh, in this room or on the stage. Um, so I, I don't like to say I'm a feminist, but I like to say I'm a feminist, that I believe in equality for women and I believe in the rights of women. Um, the abortion issue is... A, a very controversial issue that I think we probably will never all come to agree on. I happen to believe that babies that are unborn that are women <laughs> have the same rights as, you know, a baby that's born and breathing on its own. Um, I don't think that that should exclude me from being able to advocate for the rights of women on a whole host of other issues. And what, and I think it's actually held us back as women for several decades, yep. that because we get so divided on this issue, you know, people talk to me about how to recruit more women to run for office. 
Well, the minute you start talking about reproductive issues, you start dividing women. And it becomes very hard to get women to come together and just advocate because pro-choice women don't want to see pro-life women elected. Pro-life women don't want to see pro-choice women elected. And so it's become this issue. And I, I write a column for US News and World Report. And I actually wrote several weeks ago about if there was some way that we could come to some level of compromise and kind of push this issue off to the side, not that it's not important to all of us, it's fundamentally important to me, and I'm sure it's fundamental to those that are pro-choice, but if we could figure out a way to kind of move it off to the side and really make some real progress on some of these other issues, then maybe we could just come back to it. Yeah. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of stopped us in our tracks. That's I something I, I think we should make clear at some point in our website and what we do is what you've been dealing with uh, feeling like you're not completely welcomed or included in this feminist movement, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be anything about that. And that's something we should do talk about because if you're feeling that, other, other mm -hmm. Republican feminist women are feeling that. Mm -hmm. I think we do a disservice to equality to imagine that any one group of people or any you know, minority or m majority group of people should all agree on everything. Um, and I often say, you know, when we get to true equality, people will be able to bring their own uh, experiences uh, to the table and we have uh, the ability to listen and have empathy and understand and uh, bring about the right uh, change that's uh, the majority, uh, the democracy uh, dictates. And so, you know, to the extent of, um, you know, h how it's been polarized. I think, unfortunately, um, too often in politics, we let uh, one side um, dictate the other. And so we define, it lets these things get defined as, you know, oh, you have to believe all of these things or you're not a X. And um, I think we have to get beyond that. So that's what we're trying to do with the human campaign and what we want to do moving forward. The same thing if I sleep with a guy or I'm dating a guy, I'm straight. If I sleep with a girl and I'm dating a girl, I'm gay. Like, why do you have to you categorize know, people? Why? It's, why? It's, it, it's natural. It's you know, it's interesting. There's an interesting podcast on, like, categorization of people, and it's actually, like, built in your brain that you categorize. And you have to, you know, again, to fully understand you have to th have the empathy to listen to the other side. And I think we were talking about this before, but our own parties do it all too often, where, you know, um, we don't, we will say, oh, we're so open-minded, but we're not going to listen to anything that they say, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we have to get beyond that if we're going to really lead the dialogue about equality. I'd like to thank everyone so much for participating in this conversation. First, I want to thank our panelists so much for sharing their perspectives, their expertise, the different worlds from which they come, all coming together to see if they can achieve something within two years. Well done. <laughs> I, like, I like the timeline. Yes. I go, <laughs> you set a deadline. <laughs> and Lena, could you just share again the website? So if people want to yeah, go to it, the they human can. Yeah, the humancampaign.org. <laughs> Wonderful. And I want to thank our audience and all of the people who took the time to formulate and ask a question and to do it in such a lovely way. Thank you and good night. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs> we're fired up. We're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm fired well up. Doesn't <laughs> this feel good? Well done. Should Don't we do a photo? Oh, very nice. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no? picture, yeah let's do a photo. I'm used to this. <laughs> I, do, I, um, I thought, oh, I this is really...